Hugh Dalton as Chancellor of the Exchequer. Cripps was quick to leave none in doubt of his intentions, stating, first are exports, second is capital investment in industry, and last are the needs, comforts and amenities of the family. Working people, he insisted, must submerge all thought of personal gain and personal ambition, signalling that the needs of the earning class took priority. <clears throat> His measures aimed to maximise exports at the expense of working people and included a continuation of wartime fair shares rationing, to which was added bread rationing, 1946-8, and potato rationing in 1947, the introduction of fuel rationing in the winter of 1946-7 that restricted domestic consumption of electricity, forcing the closure of many factories and throwing two million workers temporarily out of work. Import controls that diverted imports to industry, producing for the export market, leaving a chronic shortage of consumer goods. And the introduction of a policy of wage restraint on the unions between 1948 and 50 a time of rising prices. Finally, when recession in America caused exports to collapse, Cripps was compelled to devalue the pound in August 1949, boosting cheaper exports, making imported consumable goods prohibitively expensive. It had always been argued that working conditions would improve under nationalisation and a planned economy. The working class had been persuaded that this would provide worker security, not being laid off in bad times. But because industry would be state controlled, wages would rise. This view, of course, is contrary to capitalism's general rule that wages are the cost of subsistence in each occupation, and ignored the fact that capitalism being a class system depends on working class exploitation as the means of extracting surplus value through the wages system. Government cannot serve both owner and worker interests, and taking over the reins of government always means taking over the control for the exploitation of working people and the removal of any obstacle that might endanger profit taking or the position of the owning class. That working people did not understand the nature of capitalism and class struggle was self evident. The Labour government had sought power and a mandate to run capitalism. And any thoughts of a brighter future were quickly dashed when wartime legislation and troops were used to curtail industrial action and crush strikes. The practice of using troops to do the work of men on strike was adopted on a number of occasions between 1945 and 51. In October 1946, the London Dockers strike, triggered by a substantial wage reduction, led to the government introduction of troops to unload ships. They were again used in the London Electricity Power Stations dispute, as well as the Bristol Dock Strike. Troops were also used in the Gas Maintenance Workers Strike of September 1949, where the Labour government used wartime legislation to take legal action against ten strikers, who were initially sentenced to one month's imprisonment, but later released on a fine. The Labour government was equally quick to display its capitalist credentials in the area of social reform, where it had the clear intention of making capitalism run more smoothly in the interest of the owners. Central to the Labour government's post-war social reforms was the Beveridge Report and the introduction of the National Health Service. In capitalism, reforms come about not normally as a result of worker agitation, but are quite often proposed by avowedly capitalist parties or organisations that recognise the need for an adjustment in the workings of the system. As capitalism changes, so the organisation of working people must also change. It had long been recognised that insecurity caused unrest and affected worker productivity. After the First World War, unemployment and general disillusionment amongst workers who had been promised homes fit for heroes, had combined to lower profits. It was widely anticipated that left unchecked similar unrest would follow the Second World War, 
and would once again lower profits. To address this issue, the Wartime Coalition set up the Interdepartmental Committee to investigate social insurance, commonly seen as the key to overcoming worker unrest. William Beveridge, a Liberal and Master of University College London, chaired the committee. The reforms proposed by Beveridge were not motivated by some philanthropic yearning to eradicate poverty. They were driven by the need to regulate class struggle and to eliminate any obstacle that might impede the profitable working of post-war capitalism. Reforms that were designed to rationalise and reduce the cost of poor relief and improve the efficiency of working men and women. His findings were published in the Report on Social Insurance and Allied Services in 1942, which was accepted in principle by the War Coalition, making it certain that most of Beveridge's recommendations would have been implemented regardless of which political party of capitalism actually won the election. A promise to implement the Beveridge reforms was a bribe that would head off the expected unrest after the war, and its timing was intended to boost wartime morale and productivity by promises of a better world. In the words of the report, each individual is more likely to concentrate upon the war effort if he feels that his government will be ready in time with plans for that better world. <coughs> Excuse me. Acceptance of reforms was regarded as imperative, for as Quentin Hogg MP, the future Lord Hailsham, put it in February 1942, if you don't give people social reform, they are going to give you social revolution. Many of the proposals were already in existence, and Beveridge's main objective was to make them universal and put them in a single unified scheme, which was to be called social security. But as the Socialist Party pointed out at the time, the term social security was a complete misnomer because it was neither social, because it was only the working class that suffered the poverty described in the report, and nor did it provide security, since the only security it offered workers was the security from starvation. The Beveridge Report identified five great evils want, disease, ignorance, squalor, and idleness, which would be overcome by child allowances, insurance schemes, a national health service, more houses, a policy of full employment, and secondary education for all. Poor relief had not substantially changed from the time of Elizabeth I, when the enclosure of common land, usually in favor of, <coughs> of more profitable sheep, resulted in legions of transient poor and the enactment of the poor laws, with poor relief administered by the parish. By the Second World War, poor relief had become a complex array of overlapping schemes and the financial burden on the parish was crippling. The wartime coalition heeded calls that central government must take an active part in poor relief to spread the burden over the whole of the owning class. The drive for this simplification and efficiency began, in, began with the 1945 Family Allowances 